Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verse 240, which reads as follows. Ayasava malang samutitang tatutaya tamewa kadati evang atidhona charinang sani kamani nayanti dugati which means just as when metal gives rise to rust that rust then eats away at the metal just so for one who acts excessively or beyond what is proper their own deeds lead to their doom this verse was taught in response to the story of Tissa now, Tissa is a very common Pali name so it's just a certain certain person, it's like John or something like that. But this Tisa is actually fairly famous and well known, this story. It's one of those, believe it or not, you might not believe that this sort of thing actually happened, but it doesn't really matter again. The stories, you can think of them as, I think the word is allegory, you don't have to believe. That's the thing about about events. Events are things that either happened or didn't happen, and whether the event happened or didn't isn't really the important thing. For, for meaning, whether the Buddha existed or not doesn't really matter. Whether he did and said and uh, taught all the things that they say he did doesn't really matter. What matters is the truth. And so practically speaking, the idea is that these things that we say the Buddha taught are helpful and lead to what they say they lead to. That's what's most important. Of course, with many of these things, we, we come to understand that they had to have happened. Meaning, for example, the Buddha had to have taught because who else could or how else could these teachings have arisen? If there wasn't someone who was remarkable Now the details of course are not important Whether the Buddha did this or did that Whether these stories actually happened I like to believe them, I tend to think they did But this story is, is mostly mundane, mostly believable Until it isn't for some people, for some It begins quite ordinarily There was a monk, uh, a man named Tissa and became a monk Spent his time with a teacher, with his upajaya and his teacher And then went his own way And went to live in the countryside And spent the rains there We have this three month rains retreat that we're currently in Today uh, He was in this three month rains retreat And at the end of it he received this traditional offering of a, a set of robes, or, or uh, some cloth, actually. The people who were there thought, uh, follow, following the tradition, that they would give him a roll of cloth, a bolt of cloth, right? That he could use to make robes, because now he had to set out, and his robes from the rains were perhaps soiled, having to live through the rain, the monsoon season. So they gave him a, a bolt of cloth that was eight cubits long. I think a cubit is uh, about, a, I don't know, from here to here or something, a couple of feet. Fairly long piece of cloth to make a robe out of. But the robe, the cloth was very coarse. Living in the country, these people were probably not very well off and not very well, not very technologically advanced either. 
And so in their simple way, they gave simple cloth, coarse cloth, hemp, or not hemp, but rough spun cotton, perhaps. And he took the robe, head, headed back to Savati, I guess, to where the Buddha was staying, and gave the cloth to his sister for safekeeping, I guess. Maybe to get ask her to wash it, I don't know, it doesn't say. And meanwhile he went to collect some needles and thread and some fellow monks and novices to help him sew the robe. You know, you have to cut it up into pieces and put it back together, the right size, the right with a with a border on it and the right measurements to make a robe. Meanwhile his sister took a look at this cloth and said, This isn't suitable for wearing, not for my brother. And because she had great love for her brother, I guess, she cut the robe up into little cut the cloth up into little pieces pounded it in a big mortar uh, until it became thread, I guess, or, or, or even just cotton particles again, cotton threads, and then spun it into new thread with a, with a technologically advanced loom or, or spindle, uh, and then with a, a loom, made it into a much, much finer cloth. And because it was much finer, it ended up being the cloth that she she wove ended up being nine cubits long and much, much more fine and, and comfortable to wear. She rolled it up and put it aside. And her brother came back, Tissa came back to pick up the, the cloth and she handed it over and he looked at it and I guess somehow he knew it was nine cubits long, so he said to her, I said, this isn't my cloth. My cloth was eight cubits long and, and very, very rough. And she said, no, no, this is yours, this is it. And I said, look, I know you're not telling me the truth, this isn't mine, it's nothing like mine. And so she explained what she had done. And she said, this is yours, it's, it's just, it's, it's a, bit, a bit different, a bit enhanced. And so he took the cloth. Doesn't say whether he was happy with it or not. But it does say, well, he became happy with it. Uh, he, he brought it back and they cut it into pieces and all these monks and novices helped him. His sister fed them and gave them uh, juice in the evening, I guess. Cared for the, them, cared for their needs, you know, supported them in their work. And until late in the night, they were finished. They had they had sewn the robe together, and he folded it up and put it on a shelf and said to himself, "Tomorrow morning, I will wear this robe." And then he he cultivated an attachment to the robe. Looking at it, thinking about it, he thought to himself, "Wow, tomorrow I will be able to wear this finely woven and well sewn robe." And he developed a, a liking of the robe. And that night, it is said that because of the food that he had eaten, whatever his sister had fed them, I guess, in the morning and the, the drinks in the evening, whatever, something was wrong. Perhaps it was too fine having lived in the country. Maybe there was some something wrong with the food. And he died. He passed away that night before he had a chance to wear the robe, after all that. Because of the fact that he had been away, I guess, from the monastery, there was no one to inherit his robe. Now, normally there are rules of inheritance among the monks. If a, a monk has an attendant, some other monk who's taken care of them or, or their student, then the robe would go to them. But there wasn't such a person, and so the monk said, well, there not being anyone, we have to divide this robe up, so they're going to cut it up into pieces and share the pieces amongst themselves. The Buddha told them not to. He said to Ananda, he said, go tell the monks to put that robe aside for seven days. 
Ananda went and told them and they put it aside for seven days and at the end of seven days the Buddha said, okay, you can cut it up. And the monks sat down and they, you know, they cut this robe up, shared it amongst themselves and they sat down and thought, I wonder why the Buddha asked us to put that, that robe aside. Is there something special about it or what was the, what was the problem? And the Buddha came and heard them talking and he said, what are you talking about? They told him and he said, oh monks, yeah you don't know but what happened was he was so attached to the robe that he was reborn as a louse. Louse is the singular of lice, these little insects that live in your hair. On that robe, he was born born on that robe. I guess the cloth had some insects in it or something. And when the monks had decided to carve up this robe, this louse freaked out knew that somehow that, that there was something happening to it, this thing that it was clinging to, and was totally distressed, completely distressed and upset. And the Buddha said, if if you had cut up that robe, that louse would have been reborn in hell for sure, because of its distressed state. But because you left it alone, it died from there and went on to be reborn in heaven apparently. And the monks heard this story and they thought to themselves, they were moved. And they said, Venerable Sir, this, this thing that they call craving, it is a deadly thing. It is a very scary thing. And the Buddha said, indeed, it's not by the deeds of others, but by our own deeds, because of our own defilements. We lead ourselves to our own doom. Just as rust arises from the metal and then eats that very metal that it arose from, so too our own defilements lead us to our doom. And then he taught this verse. So I, I think there are two lessons that we get from this. Again, one from the story and one from the verse. Maybe more, but these are the main lessons. The first is in regards to things, possessions, clinging to possessions. Well, clinging in general, of course, but if we focus specifically on, on possessions, we have this important lesson that our relationship to things can lead to great evil, great evil for ourselves. So if we we, un, we if we go to base, back to basics, we understand that the cause of suffering is craving. Our craving creates a, a bias, and our biases cannot always be satisfied, and because of that, we suffer. But craving has to take an object, and of course, so the object is things. So, in a basic sense, it's always going to be about things. And of course, one of the, the most common sort of thing is possessions. And so this example of the robe is an example of how our possessions serve as a breeding ground for, for what we might call evil. I mean, specifically craving. And for this reason, possessions are taken quite seriously in Buddhism. Our relationship to them, our appreciation, our understanding of them, how we use them, how we uh, relate to them. And so the Buddha talked about reflecting wisely, using wisely, understanding and and using as a framework to create an um, a sense of what's right a sense of how to behave how to act 
So the verse uses the, the word atidona charinam, one who behaves beyond what is appropriate or something like that. And so it's, a, it's an apt description, I think, of, of what we mean by evil and what we mean by uh, defilement. It's what goes beyond what is appropriate. It doesn't mean that we can't have or use or engage with everything, really. There's nothing that we can't or shouldn't engage with. It's just how we engage with it. The way in which we engage with it. I mean, of course, let me qualify that by saying that there are certain uh, things that, that it will be obvious that the only reason for engaging in it is not a very good one, like alcohol, for example. Or drugs or so on But they can all, they, even alcohol could be used Of course to cleanse a wound Or so on, something like that But that's, that's the, the specifics The point is It's how we behave Not what we behave with Or, or what we engage with How we engage with things Our manner and so reflecting wisely is, is the most important thing. The Buddha didn't have very stringent or strict rules about the sorts of things we could use. But he was very careful about how we use them and how we approach getting them. And how we, we think of their purpose and their use and their importance. And so this this led to various teachings that can that can be sort of categorized into three types. The first is reflecting in a mundane sense, and so this is sort of practical or pragmatic. It's a, a simple mundane way of of thinking of proper ways to use things and improper ways to use things. For example, a robe or any time, type of clothing. An improper way to use it, what would that be? Well, if we use clothes to beautify ourselves. Obviously, if we use them with infatuation, being attached to them like this, this monk Tissa was, it can become quite obsessive. We, we, we become very attached to our clothes and Monks can become very attached to their robes, even attached to how they look in their robes. Boy, I look very much like a good monk, like, like a monk in these robes. We can get attached to the feel of them if we have soft and comfortable robes. And, and of course, by extension, how much more so lay people who wear such fine and, and fancy clothes, silk or... Uh, bright colored clothes Suggestive clothes that show off our curves and our assets uh, Brand name clothes that show off our wealth and our power If you think about just, just this one example Clothing can be an incredible, incredible attachment I mean, perhaps not one type of clothing But it's so generative of, of attachment and ego our clothing Something very much for us to, to consider and think about Of course an important use It doesn't mean that we shouldn't use clothes Because clothes have an important use, of course If we didn't wear them we'd be naked And that would be, well, unpleasant in many ways It would be distracting in many ways It would be conducive perhaps to lust amongst, uh, amongst us and so using them for those purposes is valid And of course the usage doesn't always differ It's our attitude towards it You can wear the same set of clothes and be very much attached to it Or be not attached to it at all Depending again on your attitude And so wise reflection is something that we consider important Another example is food some people might think you have to eat certain foods or not eat certain foods, don't eat delicious foods. 
that you have to eat plain food, food that has no taste, and that's not really at all important. Now, to qualify this, it's important that we understand that if we have attachments to these things, then we would be best served by limiting the types of things that we use. If a person is attached to beautiful clothes, then yeah, wearing a, a robe might be a very useful thing. It's why monks are told to wear only a robe. We're, we're only allowed to wear one type of clothing. It's a very simple rectangle. And it's not even that, it's cut up into pieces. So it can't even be one smooth piece. For that very reason, that it's very easy, very much likely that us as ordinary individuals, even as monks, are, are, you know, just because we're a monk doesn't change that fact, that we can very much get attached to these things, and it can lead even as monks to be reborn as a louse, or be reborn in hell, or so on. Hungry ghosts is a common destination for monks with great attachment. And so, yes, it is important to limit, but only because of our attitude. And this is solved not by denying ourselves, that's not the solution. It's solved ultimately by changing the way we look at things. So reflecting wisely is an important part of this. When you eat, you reflect on why you're eating. Not to fatten yourself up, not for pleasure or for enjoyment, for, for diverting yourself from being mindful from, from uh, facing reality objectively but for health, for keeping you alive for allowing you to continue to cultivate spiritual practices the third example is with uh, dwellings, residences and the fourth example is with medicines. These are the four requisites that the Buddha talked about. They're not just examples. They're a pointing out of those things that we can't live without. And because we can't live without them, we have to be extra careful. They're not the sorts of things we can say, okay, I'll just never use that again. Many things we can do that with. We can give up in order to benefit our spiritual practice. But these four you can't. And so we have to recognize that ultimately they will be the final things that we have to come to terms with or on a basic level things that everyone has to come to terms with. This is the first way of reflecting. The second way of reflecting is more intentional, meaning you try and create an, or evoke some emotion about things. The example the Buddha uses, or the, the way the Buddha approaches is this, is in regards to the negative qualities of those things. The fact that our using them has limits. Because, of course, the problem is in attachment to them. You use something and you feel pleasure in being able to use it, you think of it as a good, you conceive of it as being a pleasurable experience. Not just because there's a soft robe, but because you're happy about it. Look at me, I'm wearing this beautiful, brightly colored clothing and so on. And so the Buddha's douse of reality was to remind us that you might think that there's some beauty or some greatness, some, some goodness in wearing that, but just remember, the longer you wear that robe or those clothes, the more dirty they become. He said, by wearing those clothes, they become putrid. And he, he encouraged us to reflect on this. Reflect on this, not because it's any truer than them being beautiful or anything. I mean, ugly, beautiful, they're just concepts. But again, this is the intention behind this. You, you purposefully evoke an opposite. Uh, perspective to help balance it out, to help you gain perspective because a person who is very much attached to something needs this dose of reality it's like you're kind of lopsided there or skewed perception 
when you remind yourself of these things being putrid as the body oils and, and smells and skin and, and, and so on get rubbed off onto it, the reality is they become quite putrid. When you remember that, it, it, it balances out your perspective. It helps to straighten out your perspective on these things. It's a good thing to remind yourself of. And so it's especially useful or mostly useful for people who have these sorts of lust and, and passion and desire, attachment to things. The reminder that food, look at this beautiful food I have. Oh yes, but once you put it in your mouth, it already becomes disgusting. You wouldn't want to take it out of your mouth and then eat it again. In Thailand there was a monk, who maybe many, but there was one monk I heard of who taught this. Every, he said every time when you put food in your mouth, every time you like that food, take it out of your mouth and put it back in the bowl. and then Or put it aside, and then at the end you have to eat those, those balls of food again. That you've already gotten wet and, and, and mushy and saliva covered. Uh, but that doesn't end there. Once it gets into your stomach, it becomes something that no one would ever want to touch again. And, and it doesn't stop there because once it goes through the stomach and into the intestines and so on and so on. And once it comes out the other end, no human being or, well, very few hum human beings, no human being in their right mind would have any, any interest in touching it. Not even with a glove. But another way of looking at this is the limitations. It's not just things being disgusting, but it's realizing that the pleasure is limited and any pleasure leads to attachment. And because things are subject to, to cessation, subject to corruption, subject to aging, the Buddha talked about things, possessions, not just people, but all these things that we have, our robes, they fall apart. Nothing lasts forever. And so if you cling and, and hold on to things, you'll ultimately be dissatisfied when they change, when they disappear, when you lose them, when they break, when they rip and tear. That's where suffering comes from. But the third way... It's the most interesting for us as meditators, the third way of reflecting. Not that the other two are not valid and important, useful for meditators as well. But the deepest reflection is the third reflection the Buddha offers. It's called the reflection as elements. It's the reminder that things don't actually exist, nor does the person who uses the things. It's a very profound reflection. The Buddha said, yata pachayang bhavatamanam. This thing that we call a jiwara, a robe, a cloth, it's only made up of elements. It's only made up of, what do we mean by elements? Well, it's made up of earth and air and water and fire, but what it means is it's made up of experiences, in fact. There's the hardness or the softness in this case with the robe. There's the temperature it has of feeling hot or feeling cold. There's the tension in it, the flaccidity when it becomes, when, it, when it's, the tension is released. Those are the experiences that we have. And there's the resulting experiences of seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and feeling and thinking that are sort of a product of all of those, the qualities of it. A robe is only made, or any thing is only made up of its qualities. Those qualities create experiences. And those experiences are what is ultimately real, meaning they're how we experience, they're, they're how we interact with it. We don't ever have the robe, or the, the food, or the medicine, or the, the, you know, the, the residence. We only have ever have our experiences of them. And so this reminder is ultimately the basis of meditation practice. This is what sets our minds straight. 
and in line with experience of reality as it truly is. This is where mindfulness begins. When we remind ourselves that what is real is the experiences of the robe, seeing it, feeling it, smelling it when it's disgusting, soiled, tasting our food, even seeing and smelling the food, and so on. With everything, there will always be only experiences. And this reminder changes everything. This is where meditation, again, where it begins. And this is where enlightenment, the path to enlightenment, really begins in earnest. When you reflect this way, that all these things, things that I hold on to, they're all just made up of experiences. Once you make that shift, there is nothing to hold on to. There's nothing you could hold on to because experiences, what are they? What is an experience? It's momentary. We don't cling to the experience, not really. We cling to the thing behind the experience. Or it's not even really behind the experience, it's external to the experience. It's extrapolated from the experience. We don't even know that this, I don't even know that this is a real robe that I'm wearing. All I know is that all I have all these experiences and I conceive based on all those experiences, that I'm actually wearing a robe. I don't actually know what's the truth of it. It's all just extrapolation and conception in the mind. So this is the first lesson. More from the story. And just generally in regards to craving as a whole. But that's the lesson. That's a very general, basic Buddhist lesson that, of course, we always... Well, we... we it should be quite familiar to us But the other sort of interesting specific lesson to this verse Is this idea of suffering coming from our own acts It's a very classical Buddhist, core Buddhist doctrine Other people don't cause us suffering External things don't cause us suffering Our suffering comes from our own deeds. So this simile of metal and rust. Rust comes from metal. Uh, me metal gives rise to rust. Rust eats away at the metal. Defilements, in the same way defilements come from the mind. The mind gives rise to defilements and the defilements turn around and are the cause of the destruction of the mind. Mind creates something, that thing destroys. That thing that the mind creates turns around and destroys the mind. And I think there are three aspects to this as well. The first part of the lesson is that we often have this, this wrong perspective. Again, that it is things external to us that cause us suffering. It's one of the biggest obstacles, one of the great obstacles to meditation practice, where if someone has this perspective that their problems, their suffering, is caused by things external to themselves, it very much gets in the way of meditation, of course. If you don't have this, real, this understanding that the problems are within you, right? That all these external problems are not actually the problem If you can't understand that It's very difficult Very unlikely That you would want to meditate It's something we can see in the world Why many people don't meditate it, on, on the flip side The idea that happiness is outside of you Whether it be happiness or suffering If you see it, the source of it outside of yourself It's very unlikely that you're going to ever be interested in meditation practice And so it often takes fairly extreme forms of suffering For people to wake up and realize how wrong they've been When they can no longer change their external circumstances To be the way they want That they change their perspective They realize that the solution for them And they really feel like they have to find a solution Has to be somewhere else they realize they can't 
find happiness in the world around them. It shouldn't be that way. But it is that way because of our great, great delusion and misunderstanding and being misled by ourselves, by society, by those who have come before. We have built up in society a very wrong way of looking at happiness and suffering, of course. The idea that it's outside of ourselves, both happiness and suffering. The second part of the lesson is for meditators. Because again, we often think that success in meditation relates to externalities. We might think that we have to meditate in, a, in a, the company of others. We might think that we have to meditate at a certain time. We might be disturbed in our meditation because of things that are happening. I can't meditate because there's noise. I can't meditate because it's too hot or too cold, too hungry. We might think I'll meditate at a certain time, maybe next week or next month or next year. We might even quite simply relegate our meditation to those times when we're sitting cross-legged on a on a mat. For some people it's very, there's this very strong association with the formal act of meditation. This is very common. People not realizing that meditation has to be it's a, it's maybe a, a a misnomer. It's not the right word anymore. This is why we often use the word mindfulness. Because it sounds more like something you can do anytime. So if we say that you are always supposed to be meditating, they may think, what, well, you can never leave your mat. But if we say always be mindful, it's more clear that you can do it anytime and should. So the point is that meditation or mindfulness has nothing or very little to do with your circumstances. And the idea that our success or failure, our spiritual advancement, has anything to do with externalities is wrong. If we relate this to the story, we we can see that this this monk's uh, suffering had nothing to do with his life. He he he, appeared, he he had a life that was the envy of so many of, of so many Buddhists. He was first of all living with the Buddha. He was a monk. He was uh, probably seemed like a fairly good monk. He didn't even want this fine robe that his sister gave him. He was content with a coarse robe. He he cut up the robes. You know he 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 went to the extent of following all the monks' rules and lived a life that was quite pure. And so all of the externalities fell into place. But yet when he died. He was reborn as a lowly insect, believe it or not. Regardless of whether he was born as an insect or whether people can actually be born as insects, there's no question that there are grave consequences to clinging. It's, it destroys the mind. It consumes you. It, it has consumed countless beings in the past right now it is consuming countless beings and in the future too it will consume countless beings and lead them to their doom nayanti dugating lead they lead these our own acts our own states of mind lead us to bad places And so we have to understand that meditation and mindfulness is something that has to be unrelated or independent of our circumstances. It's something we should do when we get in a car accident, it's something we should do while we are talking to people. <laughs> well we should well, what we should something we should do while we are working to the best I often get this question about things like talking things like reading, working and it's true that there are many things that we do that can't be done completely mindfully because your mind is 
otherwise uh, occupied, and that's fine. You know, there's no question that we should always be engaged in the practice. But the point is, we should have this understanding that our spiritual progress, it's a different lesson, our spiritual progress has nothing to do with our circumstances. It can be performed anywhere, if you decide and when you decide to perform it, not when you have the right circumstances. And the third lesson, somewhat related and perhaps similar or even the same, is the point that, and this is the most technical part of the lesson or the most related to meditation practice, that our suffering is not caused by our experiences. It's caused by our reactions to them. And so another common thing for meditators is to become discouraged when their practice doesn't go as planned. So not only the externalities don't fall into place, but the actual practice doesn't appear to be progressing. Why do they think it's not progressing? Because it's painful, because it's chaotic, because it's uncontrollable. When in fact these are the realizations that have to, have to occur in order to find true peace, happiness and freedom from suffering. Meditation um, or enlightenment requires a change of perspective, a change of attitude, a change in the way we look at things. Those things that we see as stable, we have to come to see are in unstable, unstable, unstable. Uh, those things that we think of as satisfying, we have to come see that they're not come to see that they're not going to satisfy us. Those things that we see as me and mine and under my control are none of the above. And so it is to be expected and appreciated and lauded when, that some, when a meditator comes to realize these things. When a meditator experiences impermanent suffering non-self. Because they will come to see that their suffering their suffering has nothing to do with what they experience. They, they, that happiness and suffering can't be dependent on the things we experience. Because those things are never going to satisfy us. Are always going to upset us. F for as long as we cling to them. And this is the truth. It's not a, a view or a belief or, or a, um, a personal opinion. It's the truth. If it weren't the truth, then clinging would be great. Then we could find happiness and, and freedom from suffering in things. If they were stable, satisfying and controllable. The fact that they are not makes it imperative that we change our perspective, that we stop looking to anything Anything, anything for happiness as a source of satisfaction, as a source of peace. Only then can we find true peace, true happiness and true freedom from suffering. That's what mindfulness is meant to show us and meant to lead us to. So a good verse, a good reminder of two very important lessons. And just the general lesson that craving is the cause of suffering. Don't be like Tissa and crave and cling to things because you might just be born as a louse. That's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for listening. I wish you all peace.